pleased to lead this August mini retreat here at the Shrine of the North American Martyrs, the holiest grounds we have really anywhere in this country. I think we sometimes forget to truly appreciate that. My name is Dan O'Connor. As Father McGuire said, we'll be telling you about our peers, our age group, our potential, our challenges in becoming the next generation of Catholic leaders. So the Frasati, the, the capital region Frasati chapter is the full name of our group. We're a group of young adult Catholics in the Albany region. There's seven of us here present today. Myself, Brian Slezak will be coming soon. He's the seminarian for our diocese who actually started the group. Nate Harrison, Natalie Full, Louise Schreckenghost, Rosa Braden, and Emily Celeste. Now, I was going to invite up Brian first to give a few words on the founding of the group, but uh, since I'm not exactly sure when he'll wind up showing up, I'll just say a, a little bit about it. The Frasati group began in, in 2007 to 2008 with a few people meeting once a month for coffee and creed, is what we called it. it uh, that went very well for a year or two, but then it kind of died out. And then myself and several others decided we, there was a great need for young adult Catholic fellowship in the diocese. Between, between college graduation and the start of family life, it's a very unholy age for most people. They have no preference for the faith generally, so you really need to reach out to them. And that's what we try to do with the Frasati group, and we've been amazed with the outpouring of faithful, orthodox, young adult Catholics that were somewhere buried in our diocese that we never really knew about. So we have very, a very flourishing group right now. We meet every week with at least a dozen people a week. We have over a hundred people on our email list. We do monthly service events, be it volunteering at a nursing home or uh, praying outside of Planned Parenthood. We go on hikes, and also every couple months we have uh, Frasati on tap events, where it's, we, we have a speaker, be it a priest or a deacon, someone with authority, speaking at a tavern or a pub, where we try to invite in and evangelize more young adult Catholics who probably wouldn't come for a Bible study, but they might come to enjoy a beer and hear some theology. So that's the, that's the gist of our Frasati group that we have. And in lieu of Brian, I will start for the next few minutes trying to give you a bit of a State of the Union address with regard to the youth and the faith, as best as I've been able to tell in the past few years. I'll give you both the good and the bad, and then I'll end with the best advice I can come up with on how you can thrive in this age and also help youth, our peers, to become the next holy and righteous leaders that our church and our world is going to desperately need to carry us through the difficult times ahead. So I'd love to start with the good news. There's lots of good news. There's much more good news than bad news, I would say, actually, when it comes to young adults in the faith. We know, as a whole, society continues down its miserable path of destruction. We know that. I don't think anybody here would deny that. We were all reminded of that on June 24th of this month, of this year, the feast day of St. John the Baptist, a martyr for the sanctity of marriage, when our own state decided to legalize and bless immoral unions. Just another wake-up call for all of us who perhaps are tempted to sit in the pews and think that things will get better by themselves. But, despite that, the opposite trend is what we see within the ranks of church-going, seeking youth in the Catholic Church. Their faithfulness is definitely on the rise. I would primarily thank Blessed Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI for this. Thanks to them, the youth are more than ever starting to reject the lukewarm, the watered-down teachings that started to infiltrate so many Catholic circles in the past several decades. And we also have great blessings here in our own country that have caused this amazing flourishing of the faith. The first things that come to my mind are EWTN, Mother Angelica. The Franciscan University at Steubenville seems to have its, its tentacles of faithfulness and orthodoxy all over the country. Um, the Cardinal Newman Society, which is uh, an organization that rates Catholic colleges. It's kind of a watchdog group to make sure that they are faithful to Rome, faithful to the truth, instead of just raising the next generation of heretics. 
And the last thing is the flourishing of newly founded, faithful, religious orders. But I'd like to speak of some of my own experiences I've had recently with this renewal. So the most recent was just last week, actually, I returned from a month-long road trip across the country in a Greyhound bus. That was a miserable experience for the most part, but as anybody knows, we've been in a Greyhound bus. But uh, on the way out to California, I stayed in Indiana with an order of priests called the Franciscan Brothers Minor. This is a newly founded order, founded just in 2009 by a Capuchin Franciscan. They are flourishing, faithful, and orthodox. I'd like to remind, uh, this is what I learned when I was visiting them. They reminded me that Vatican II called for orders to get back to their original characters and to hearken to the words of their founders. The opposite happened with many orders, but many orders also listened to Vatican II, and this is the greatest I've ever seen. These, I stayed with these brothers for three days last month, and they follow St. Francis without gloss, just as the Capuchins first understood it in the, 15th, in the 16th century. They already have at least 20 men in just less than two years they've been operating. Their poverty is truly authentic. It's extreme. They rely entirely on God's providence, and this is how they prove that they really trust Him. When you can be so poor that you need Him every day just to get by. Their food, if they get donated a, a large amount of food, they'll give away all of it except what they need for three days. They'll only keep three days of food on them, and if somebody comes to them asking for food, they'll give away the last crumb they have in their cabinet. They figure if God wants them to fast for a day, that's fine. It's better off them doing that than some needy child, because they always they have their, their uh, friary in a very poor neighborhood in Indiana. My first day there, and I didn't find this out until later, it happened to be one of those days when there was a couple packages of ramen noodles in the cupboard and nothing else. So the friars were a little worried. They were thinking that uh, you know, during the first day of my visit, there wouldn't be a dinner. But it just so happened that as they were about to start preparing these few ramen noodles, a large donation of food came in and we had a great dinner. This is what happens to them all the time when they rely on God's providence. They each have one tunic that they wear year-round. They're barefoot, no sandals. And one thing that especially stuck with me, of course, is their prayer routine. Prayer is the heart of everything they do. They pray all seven hours of the divine office. After night prayer, you're allowed to go to bed at about 10.30. And then at 11.50 p.m., when you're on the, on the floor in your cell sleeping, you hear a knock, knock, knock on your door. And then, praise be Jesus and Mary, the brother says. You have to immediately respond, now and forever, and then you report to night prayer at midnight. After half an hour or 45 minutes of night prayer, you can go back to bed for another four hours or so until the same routine, praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever, and you report to start the day. It's a rigorous prayer schedule, and you might think that after years of this, it would wear down on you, and you would be a gloomy, miserable person. Absolute opposite is true. These friars are the most joyful people you will meet, and not only joy, but also just, just downright cheeriness, joviality. They have it to the extreme. And these this is their living the absolute opposite life that the world would suggest, but also the opposite life that modern Catholics have come to believe is needed. We don't have to abandon the original charisms of the saints just because of new technology. Now they don't disdain technology, they have a website. They didn't make it, someone else made it for them because they don't own anything, but they don't disdain technology, but they also do not permit it to distort the original charisms. And I just, I say so much about them because they're an example of the flourishing of faithfulness among these newly founded religious orders. There's many of them. Uh, the CFR is Father Benedict Groeschel's order, the Sisters of Life. There's uh, Tridentine Mass Order, for Fraternity of St. Peter, that's starting to thrive now. There's, there's many. And all these people are on fire for the truth as well. This order that I'm just telling you about, I literally bumped into them at the March for Life this year. That's how I found out. I bumped into them at the March for Life. And they have so much more of a right to preach this truth 
than anybody because their lives are irreproachable sermons of that truth. The bottom line is that it's those environments. These are the environments in which saints are made. And if we have saints, we have nothing to fear, nothing at all. And if we don't have saints, it doesn't matter how good things might look from a worldly perspective, we have nothing.